Splendid. Good afternoon all and welcome to the Commit Happy Hour here on Friday the 21st of August at half past three. Your hosts here in the skimming, myself and Stuart Young, are here to help engage the conversation around the next generation. We are joined, very pleasingly joined here, by Alison, Noosh, Adam, Lauren and Brad, who are going to be talking about how we can steer that new generation of students into being engineers uh, to make sure that the good work that is going on is continued into the future. So um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, is I'm going to hand you over to Stuart, um, but make sure you've charged your glass. Obviously, we have a young, younger generation with us, so um, I'm hoping it's all um, soft drinks rather than pure neat gin in the glass, as if it ever would be. Um, and I'll hand you over to Stuart. Good health. Thank you, Ian, and welcome to everybody. Um, OK, so the latest edition of the Commit Happy Hour. A uh, bit of a difference to what we normally present, um, as you'll see. A um, bit, bit about Commit before we start. The, the Commit community um, is a collaboration platform that brings together industry, be them clients, contractors, academia, and solution providers. And we solve problems by creating enablement um, and developing projects. Um, we couldn't do that without people um, and without people coming through the ranks from the earliest of days, um, we couldn't solve all the problems that we, we have in industry. And we have a wealth of experience today, or it certainly will be in a few years time. Um, children are born into a digital age uh, and advanced in the use of technology today before they even go to school. They grow up in a smart world designed, engineered and constructed by a smart industry. So why, when they get to those most influential teenage years, does a career in our industry pass them by? We're inviting you today to join the discussion and explore the transformational education that can teach this digital generation the opportunity that is AEC, Architecture, Engineering and Construction. So, um, Commit. I'm just going to talk a little bit now, if I can go to the next slide. Um, talked about the um, opportunity. I'm just going to say about questions. Please ask questions all the way through. Um, most of you on the call have noticed, um, have been on before, be very familiar with how this operates. There are two ways you can do it. Raise your hand or type the question in the box and send, and I'll pick that up. Um, and hopefully we can ask the questions during the session. I have a number of questions that have come in beforehand, so I will ask those as well. Um, so I mentioned about productivity. Um, these webinars that we've been running since March um, this year um, cover everything that productivity might mean to you as an organization or as an individual. Um, it asks the question whether you've got the means in your organization to improve productivity. It looks at what else is out there making a difference in other industries. Can we share that? Um, can we cross fertilize? Can we swap over? Um, and how, mi how might it help you? An example is the aerospace industry where automation and modular construction seems to be the norm. Um, Commit is running an initiative that has established um, Commit to Productivity and it does help create enablement for improvement uh, for opportunities to look at opportunities and develop projects. Um, the areas that we're looking at, as you'll see on the screen, that's not an exclusive or an exhaustive list, but it certainly covers everything that the members have um, pointed out we need to be looking at so far. Um, some are outside the reach of some of the individual members, but others are um, areas which they're well acquainted to. And it, it hopes that we don't leave areas out. We need to include everybody from the owner uh, through academia to the solution providers and of course the people with the problems are the contractors so um there is something for everybody and and with some areas there there's something for several um we are running the commit to productivity initiative and we've started and have um, got successfully running um an advisory group where the individuals the passionate individuals from the members the member companies can contribute um that is running something running and 
if you want to get involved in that, please do reach out to me. So let me just move on to the next slide. I've got a slide freeze. There we are. Okay. There is no poll question today and there are no curveball questions um, because we're going to leave as much time as we possibly can for the dialogue, the discussion uh, that's coming. Um, I talked about the um, what we're doing here today entitled, as a lot of you will know, Teach Your Children to Suck Eggs. And Alison will explain a bit more about that in a second or two. Um, but let me introduce the team. Okay. So we've got Alison. Alison is um, Alison Watson, MBE founder and chief executive of um, uh, business class of your own. Um, Alison's a former landsphere and, and, and founder and chief executive of class of your own. Alison created the innovative design engineer construct um, learning programs for secondary school students aged 11 to 18 and is supported by some of the world's leading AEC companies, professional bodies and universities. Uh, DEC programs are delivered in schools and colleges throughout the UK and internationally uh, and this has resulted in young people entering the sector to pursue a wide range of digital careers through technical and degree apprenticeship and traditional university pathways. So thank you very much Alison for joining us today and helping set up the session. Um, I'm now going to introduce the team. We normally call it the panellists. Um, we've got Nushin um, Nushin Akarami has um, got years of experience and background in industry and academia. Nushin is a chartered architectural technologist, um, a fellow member of the Higher Education Academy and a practitioner member of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. Um, currently employed by the University of Bolton as a Strategic Property Projects Officer and Environmental Sustainability, Sustainability Lead. Goodness. Um, um, working on, a, on a, a number of developing environmental and sustainable strategies, policies and action plans for the university. Um, Nushin holds a first class honours degree in architectural technology, an MSc in planning, sustainable, environmental and in teaching and learning and has recently started her PhD studies on corporate sustainability. Nushin is a regional member of SEAT Northwest um, as a regional councillor and represents the committee uh, at the regional CIC committee um, as a vice chair. Um, still going left to right, we've got Brad. Bear with me. Brad Lees is a 21 year old advanced apprentice civil engineer coming into his sixth year at Mott MacDonald. As part of his current apprenticeship, he studies one day a week at Liverpool John Moores, um, taking a bachelor's degree in civils, civil engineering. Um, Brad studied to start with. Um, DEC for two years at St Ambrose Barlow RC High School in Swinton before choosing DEC route as one of his options. As he says, he didn't have much idea as what to do or which way he'd like to go, um, but DEC helped him do that and was a bit of a leap of faith. Um, joined Matt Mott MacDonald in 2015 as a 16 year old, um, studied at Salford City Council for two years completed an MVQ level three a year ahead of schedule. Well done Brad for doing that. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, life after DEC has involved a lot of um, a lot of hard work, <laughs> DEC as he puts it. In 2017 he had the privilege of speaking at the House of Lords with class of your own about his experiences with DEC and the importance of the construction industry getting involved with education. Shortly after this, he was shortlist, shortlisted for finalists for the Manchester Chamber of Commerce Apprenticeship um, and winner of the CDA Young Professional of the Year. In an attempt to give back for the opportunities that he's had, he volunteered at the work experience, oh, sorry, to be the work experience champion for the Mott MacDonald Ultragun Office. Um, and this allows him to help other young aspiring engineers make a similar journey. Well done, Brad. Um, Lauren, who's not able to join us at the moment, she's currently um, pouring 500 cubic metres of concrete somewhere in the north, um, but may join us on a call a bit later. Uh, Lauren is 20, she's a WSP civil engineering degree apprentice and currently on secondment with Balfour Beatty, who've put her immediately to work. I wouldn't expect anything differently. Um, she discovered a passion for STEM at school, she chose to go on the study 
uh, Design Engineer Construct as one of her GCSE option choices. And this introduced Lauren to the digital built environment and the career that she loves. She left school at 16 after gaining excellent GCSE results, including an A plus in DEC, choosing a technical apprenticeship pathway rather than traditional A levels. She started at Mouchelle Consulting and quickly became an apprentice role model for other young students. <clears throat> Following the DS WSP takeover, she continued within the highways division and within two years achieved a ENG tech qualification. Um, Lauren is now studying BNG civils at Liverpool John Moores and has achieved a further ICE request or ICE quest scholarship. She hopes to achieve chartered status by the time she's 27. Lauren is an active member of the local IC forum and Weiss um, DC, DEC ambassador, inspiring other young people to follow in her footsteps. Lauren, I hope you join us soon and that concrete poured. Uh, <clears throat> right, now next we've got Adam. Adam will be 13 next month and has volunteered to take part in the happy hour today. As you could probably see, Adam is in Cornwall on his holidays in a place called Bude. Never been there, but I believe it's fantastic. <clears throat> Adam is exactly the target market to be an engineer. He's bright, excellent in maths and science, and has learned very little about engineering in school because they don't teach you that. <clears throat> he started secondary school last year, but obviously only had half a year, and we'll be heading back into year eight in a couple of weeks. Um, just tell you a bit about Adam's dad, Glyn. Um, Glyn is very keen to improve awareness in schools and last year arranged a trip for Ravi. Some of you may know Ravi. He was the ambassador from NASA that has been engaged with Commit for a number of years um, and has done a number of school visits uh, as well as universities when he's been over on Comet work in the UK. Okay, um, the little footnote that you put in there, Adam um, and Glyn, we wouldn't be offended if we didn't include you absolutely not everybody's included in this they've got to be otherwise we won't make any progress so thank you very much adam for joining us today so um for some reason my slides have advanced all the way through to the end so i don't know why that's happened um okay alison i'm going to hand over to you now um i'm going to put my camera on um on quiet um hand over to you and uh, and let you roll away Thank you, Stuart. So, Thanks a lot. And uh, and yeah, I mean, with, with, with accolades like that from such young people, um, it, it makes me very, very proud um, to kind of end Friday on a note that, that basically says, you know, I, I, I started um, as that same sort of, I guess, 16 year old, good at maths. I mean, I, I, I suppose I'm kind of a, a, a female version of Adam. I was good at maths at school. And very very little help but that was back in 1987 and you guys do the maths you know i'm 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 ready for retirement actually i'm not i'm never retiring i love this job but but the fact is that my <laughs> has not changed since uh since i was 16 in terms of um you know seeing careers advice uh get any better for, for young people um, and as an industry i think we're still forgive me, bleating about the same things that we bleated about back then. Um, and hence there's some times where, you know, we may be a very, 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 very small fish in a very large pond, but we've just kind of got our heads down, got on with it, regardless of politics, regardless of issues, regardless of size. We just know that sometimes you just have to create opportunities. And there's a favorite quote that I want to read out before we start. And this is, um, this is Sir Ken Robinson. A great educator from the northwest, a Liverpudlian. Um, so you know he is up north with us. Um, he moved to Los Angeles some years ago because I think he get, became so disenfranchised with his own education system, um, and now he goes all around the world. He's uh, he's getting on in years, we could say. But this is a very profound statement, and I'm just going to let it sit with you and digest for a couple of seconds uh, before we kind of move on. So here's his quote. This is um, from a TED talk in 2010. And again, I still worry that nothing's changed much. So he said, education, in a way, dislocates very many people from their natural talents. And human resources are like natural resources. They are often buried deep. You have to go looking for them. 
they're not just lying around on the surface. You have to create the circumstances where they show themselves. And I think that's really, really profound. I think it's really, really aligned to our industry because we have to create circumstances to enable young people like Adam, who wants to be an engineer, guide them on a pathway with or without the help of schools to become the Brad and eventually become the new Shin and God help them, maybe even become a little bit of me. Um, if only for having a, um, I, I guess the um, passion to continue when I must say, the politics of what I've been doing for the last 10 years have been enough to drive you mad. Never mind, just pack it all in. And interestingly, um, in The Guardian only yesterday, we all know what's been going on with the exam system and so on. The exam system has been hijacked by politicians obsessed with cliff edge testing and rankings. It's time teachers led the debate. That's a headline in The Guardian online from yesterday. So it's kind of bringing those two things together. Now I wrote um, a, a, an article um, for a lovely friend of mine, John Aynan, when he was writing his construction manager's handbook um, some years ago. And I called it BIM Leaders of the Future, Engaging the Digital Generation. And as I say, this was probably five years ago. And the reason why I called this Teach Your Children to Suck Eggs is that you know, children are already, you know, if you say, you know, digital natives, all those kind of things, children are already there. Adam, I know for a fact, is a whiz on Minecraft. I've just worked with 20 people who weren't interested at all in the construction industry. They signed up for a summer school with the London Legacy Development Corporation just because they were bored. They wanted to do something during lockdown. And these kids, the digital bit was not the issue. Our kids are digital. The sad thing is, is that the digital and, uh, and, and, and the careers advice to transform that digital, digital uh, prowess that they have, that digital knowledge that they have, is everywhere. I mean, I just did a quick Google uh, of, of, you know, which, where, where are the jobs for digital? You know, I just literally put in jobs in digital. And this is the order from indeed.com. Uh, and this is probably about an hour ago. So digital midwife, I didn't even know that existed. Digital midwife. Digital content coordinator, research assistant, self-employed advocate, I don't know what that is, a tribunal caseworker, social media marketer, head of digital marketing. And then from another website, I got, got skills and knowledge in fields like web development, social media and performance marketing are excellent uh, uh, criteria to have for a job in digital. And you just think, so where's, where's construction there? You know, the leading job recruitment websites. So knowing what I know now and wishing I knew what I knew now then when I was 16 years old, I almost want to question how as an industry and how as universities can we encourage more young people into AEC professions? Because even after the BIM mandate, even after um, my lovely friend Peter Hansford talked about skills and development in the um, yeah, construction policy. Why are we still having the same con con uh, conversation now? Um, so I think the first thing I'd like to do, and almost to put him on the spot a little bit, is talk to Adam, because I kind of want a sense of what is education like now. And I, I have a 17 year old. She wants to go into sound engineering and acoustics, and she's getting very little help. Um, but she's 17 and she's got a mum like me. So as you can imagine, I've been kind of helpful because I've got a lot of friends in industry. Um, Adam, there's a few things we talked about last night. So maybe you want to tell us just a little bit about you, what you want to be and what help you're getting from school at the moment and indeed from industry. Um, I don't know if anybody's coming into school to help you, but just tell us a little bit about you. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm 13 next month and I live in Cheshire. I just joined a new school in September. I'm year seven. My best subjects are math, science and history, although my handwriting is terrible. Perhaps should be a doctor. <laughs> I play Minecraft and Fortnite and enjoy scratch coding. I'm interested in engineering and science in general. The good things about my education is about the specialists in secondary schools. 
as in primary schools, you get one teacher and that's a generalist for every single different subject you learn in that curriculum. However, in secondary school, you get a wide variety of teachers with degrees in different subjects. The facilities are also good, so you can do practicals. I made a buzz wire in DNT last term. Also, the last good thing about the education roles is the house roles and the outside roles. The variety of clubs and stuff like that is really good. However, there is a club, DNT, DNT club, that gives you access to a piece of software called Sketchit, which I think all people should be able to use in school. The bad points are they need basic careers advice before you do your choosing for your GCSE. I'm year seven, so I don't know if they do it in year eight. I don't know. Also, you need regular outside visits. These visits provide a lot of curricular activities for people to do and having people just to come in regularly, tell people about different jobs that are out there. The last thing is about lack of real life application. Most subjects are like, like Johnny has five apples. Jess has two pears. How many pieces of fruit do they have? That does not help you in real life at all whatsoever. Engineering in my school. Sketch it is really the only bit of engineering we actually do in the school. So like DNT club, but only me and one other person goes, which is a bit useless. And teachers may not know about engineering. But thank you, Adam. And 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 just just to give you some insight, and this is no disrespect to Adam whatsoever. I asked Adam last night what kind of engineer he actually wanted to be, and his answer was, "Well, I quite like an architect." And we know in industry that an engineer and architect are very different, and indeed there's loads and loads of different types. So so and because Adam gets no help with that, it's interesting. And this moves really really onto Brad because. Most of the children who start deck only know about an architect. Um, so, Brad, when you were in school, um, it's not so long ago, five years, um, what was your experience? So tell us about your school life, tell us about the access to careers of information you had, and how did you find out about um, engineering? Um, the experience I had at school was very similar to Adam's, really up until probably year 10. So from year seven till nine, there wasn't really much careers mentioned. Even when you're coming to choose your options, they just kind of said, well, what career do you want to go into on, on the day of like the options fair? And you have no idea, I didn't know. So I was like, well, what will be a footballer? That, that didn't really get you anywhere when you say that. So then, okay, um, it would be something to do with science because I, I enjoy doing science and maths. So I spoke to some of my teachers and they didn't really, I was, I was advised by my science teachers being an astrophysicist. And my, my mind just exploded at the words that I was like, I don't even know where to start with that. So my school was merging with St. Ambrose. So when I started year 10, I'd be at a new school. And St. Ambrose were offering the design engineer construct course. So I spoke to the teacher offering this at the careers fair and just said, what is it? Because it's the only one that seems to be catching my eye. So I had the, the EBAC subjects. So I chose geography and French. And then I had one option left over so i wanted to either go into ict or some sort of sport and my mum wasn't happy about that so pe on sport was crossed off the list and it was design engineer construct that i thought okay i'll go with that then and as stuart said before it, it was a leap of faith really because i didn't i didn't know much about it I'd only had a brief conversation about it with, with the teacher offering it. 
and to be fair, I don't think he had much idea of what it would fully be like. He only had a vague idea of what he wanted it to be like because we were the first year to do it at GCSE level. So when I started in year 10 at the new school, then careers started being brought up. Well, now you need to think about what what you want to do when you leave school. But I've already, I've already chosen my options, so I'm a bit limited now. That's when you start getting your careers advice, which I think is way too late. And they don't really put the put the gas on it until year 11. And then they'll say, right, you're getting right to the end of, of school now. You need to think about what college you want to go to. They don't mention apprenticeships. They just straight away, it's college. And then what courses do you want to do at college? So it was only through Design Engineer Construct that I even found out what apprenticeships were available. So speaking to Alison, speaking to my teacher, I was able to get work experience. I was able to get in, involved in the industry and learn more about it. Because like Adam, before I started Design Engineer Construct, I thought construction was an architect and then a builder, just with with bricks and blocks on site. So I didn't really know there was there was more to it than that. There's loads more to it. So doing design engineer construct and getting into the industry and people coming into school and talking about it, talking about what they do, talking about what they've seen, their experiences, that, that really helped just to make a decision of, okay, that, that is a career I actually know something about now. Because like before I said, wanted to be a footballer, that was because that was the only career I really knew about. I knew a lot about football, so I thought, oh, that that's that's a good career to get into then. Because I know I know a bit about football, I know I'm okay at playing football, so I'll go into that. But I'm glad it didn't go that way because I don't think I'd have made it. <laughs> And you've made it now because, um, again, really, really proud of Brad. Um, he is now at Mott McDonald. It started with a, a work experience. Um, I, I'm, I have to give a big up to Jason Hyde, who hopefully is on the uh, on the on the line. But um, but yeah, and, and, and Brad's never really looked back. And I remember when he had his interview, I got a phone call from Mike and said, and I was asked, where did you find him? Where do we get more like him? And, and actually, more like him have come because there's another um, Bradley Lee's just started not so long ago from from St Ambrose. So so Matthew Bates and started there. His brother's already in uh, industry. Uh, Lauren was from the same school. I think of all the others, Shania's and 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 you know um, Shervin. I mean, we could we could reel off lots and lots and lots of young people who've come out of one school alone um, who. Have been able to enter the industry, you know, construction management, uh, civil engineering, architectural technology, architecture, uh, land surveying. We've even got land surveyors at Jacobs at the moment. Um, so the whole plethora of careers are coming through just one school running one course. And again, it's because that school was able to take a, their own leap of faith and 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 come away from the traditional English bar baccalaureate, you know, and run a vocational subject with um, a little bit of confidence. Um, so um, so again, the, the whole in intention of writing a programme for young people that had the academic kudos was so imp important because unfortunately, construction generally does not. If you talk to your average teacher, um, and certainly if I think about my local grammar school, when I first approached um, uh, local schools to say, you know, if we were to write a qualification, is it something that you'd be interested in? And I still use the quote that was said to me 10 years ago, maybe even 12 years ago, thinking about it before we actually set up class of your own. The quote was, we don't do construction and engineering. We are academic. And they still don't do construction and engineering. So now, even 12 years on, I'm actually mentoring six young people from that very same school who all want to go into civil engineering. And I'm the only chance they've got of getting into that. And they are the bright young things of the future. And they are six children out of 150 that we would have lost because they have no end to the industry whatsoever. So we've got this academic issue. Uh, so it's a really, really nice thing now for, for Noosh, for Nooshin. Uh, Nooshin and I, God, I don't, I don't remember how we met, but 
I do remember that we hit it off straight away because we have similar issues. So, no, tell tell me, um, you know, what's the situation? What's the situation like in in higher education? I, I mean, I will say one thing: Bolton University have this fantastic ethos that you know they're not an ordinary university. What what makes Bolton so different? Well, uh, hello to everybody first. Uh, you and I met four years ago at the nuclear conference. Uh, and you were introducing Deck. That's that's when you and I met. Um, oh. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> when when it comes to University of Bolton, um, um, is uh, I, I do it, it does have a different place for me, obviously, because I did my first degree at University of Bolton. I'm not a typical uh, university graduate. I, I was a mother of a young boy when I started university and I graduated when I was 37 uh, for my first degree in architectural technology. But uh, and then we did provide a much wider range of uh, construction and built environment related studies at University of Bolton then uh, unfortunately those courses um, are closed including architectural technology and the only course we are actually providing at the minute is uh, civil engineering plus apprenticeship route. We do have MSc courses um, and some new degree courses are coming but what is really different in Bolton was that uh, I think part of it was because we don't have class size of 200 student and staff were very well gelled and connected and very well supported throughout their studies from making the choice as to where to go and which course to study when when we had more options uh, through their career development uh, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing but actually probably it was was the way that my uh, my lecturers perceived me and recognized some of qualities that are shown that that resulted in me becoming an academic uh, and they asking me going in and covering some classes and supporting with teaching and that's that's that had a massive impact on the way that my personal career actually started to develop it was because of the people that taught me um, at that university um, so uh, what where it is is uh, it's an interesting question uh with engineering and with, when when i was listening to the things adam was saying and the things was brad was saying about their their experiences it it, it all the time it just reminds me something and i've mentioned it here and there a few times and i remember one of to probably once at one of these nuclear gatherings somebody referred to a document is uh, called the state of the nation and i'm going back to what you said alison in terms of human resources and uh, and some of those points what what i cannot get what i can't never understand is that why is it that we don't have a plan as to how many lawyers, how many engineers, how many doctors, how many nurses, why don't we have a solid plan that how many of them we require? How many, why don't we have a solid plan? If there is, if there was a plan, then that would be communicated, should have been communicated with the schools. And then careers advice should have been much more coordinated at the schools to, to help the students like Brad and Adam to make their choices much earlier to allow people to go to school. I mean, going to school is, is an absolute um, uh, minefield. It's just, it's not that easy to go to a school to talk to a student. I mean, I, I, I don't get it. I do not get it. We did, we never had that kind of opportunity. I think part of the reason that I started working with you, Alison, at the time was I was thinking, well, Alison has already opened the doors to a school. I can go and talk to them and I can tell them about the alternatives that they can take after doing a DEC uh, program. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and it's really, really interesting because, again, I think that the way that we put out the industry generally um, to uh, young people, and, and again, please help me here, Adam, and, and even Brad, um, where the times have changed much. I actually flagged up um, to the chief exec of Crossrail, since, you, since you're on, uh, Ian, um, about the, uh, the way that children's... Uh, uh, Project like Crossrail, and we actually did a little bit of study. Um, it was the day that David Cameron shook hands when the East met the West, and David Cameron's there in his orange, uh, lovely, shiny new jacket, um, and we're all celebrating. And, um, and, and we said, okay, that was on the news last night. We went into school and we talked to, and it was um, a, a school not so far away from where I live, up here in Lancashire. We went into school, and they were all year um, sevens, um, just like Adam. Coming up to 12 years old, um, and uh, and we showed, we said to them, do one thing for us: Google Crossrail and click on images, and tell us what you think to a career with Crossrail. Now we didn't explain what Crossrail was, but we just asked them to look at the pictures. So we didn't want them to go into heavy detail. And this was the response: It looks cold and damp. It's dirty. It looks like loads of people just stand around all day. It looks like a boring job. It's not for girls. But going down that creepy tunnel in the dark would be cool. And I actually suggested that one of the ways that we could have actually attracted young people to Crossrail and had a very, very different response would have been to take, in that, last, take that last suggestion about going down that creepy tunnel in the dark would be very, very cool digitalization digitalizing the way that children saw crossrail giving them an app letting them fly through that tool at the speed of crossrail see what it's all about because unfortunately a static picture with loads of people stood around in orange and particularly david cameron probably would look a bit boring so ian i, I mean you worked on crossrail what, what what are your thoughts to all these conversations you've been around for quite some years what are your thoughts to well, I've got to say, I had a sort of a similar experience as, as Adam and Brad at school. Um, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, uh, although I've got to say, I wasn't quite as clever as Adam and Brad. Um, I was the uh, I was the thicky at school. Uh, I told that uh, I had, <laughs> told that I had dyslexia at, at nine, ten years old, uh, and that I wouldn't admit to uh, uh, get to much. Um, uh, and I should really look at doing some sort of manual labour job, um, which, uh, yes, <laughs> wasn't uh, particularly the greatest thing in the world, but luckily enough, my old man believed in me uh, and, and helped me forward from there. But um, I think the, the thing is with a lot of this is that the perception of engineering isn't great. Um, we have a, also a worry that when you get to the end of some sort of educational thing that it's not going to be relevant to the jobs that are available out there uh, and as um, Nushin was talking about earlier it's something that I am pushing at the moment is we put in place in our in our BIM world in our digital world um, looking at a supply chain of assets and things in the future we should also have a, uh, a supply chain of people in the future because I can look at projects now that won't come into fruition, won't actually be, uh, we won't put a, a spade in the ground for another 10 years. And so in 10 years time, I know what type of engineers I want, I know what type of grounds work people, what type of technicians, I know what type of, and I know what I want because I've done the analysis already. But what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to put that as a supply chain request into the education system and go, in 10 years time, I'm going to need X, Y, and Z. And these people are going to need these skills. I'm not worried that they've got a particular test, you know, tick in a box because they can add one plus one and get two. What I want is somebody who can actually do engineering. Um, I, I, I find there's that big gap between the, you know, the academic bit and the, and the doing bit. Uh, I don't have a degree. Um, I got appalling A-level results uh, and decided to study technical illustration at university um, and ended up not completing that because I'm not an academic type of person. But um, the key thing was that I, I found an engineer and I talked to them uh, and I got passionate about what they did 
and they brought me on the journey showing me technical skills rather than um, sort of academic skills as such, which was fantastic. But, but you're right, it's, it's, um, we're not getting enough education right at the bottom to say these are the kind of things that we, we do. Um, so, I mean, question for Adam, if I said to you civil engineer, what's the first thing that pops into your head? I honestly do not know because I've never been talked about about civil engineering or any engineering for that matter. Thanks. So, you know, I, but if I talk to you about um, aerospace engineering, what might jump into your mind? Plane. So, in a way, that's, that's where we in the civil engineering world fail because we, we show things, wonderful things in aerospace and aeronautical and automotive, fast cars, wonderful engineering. But when it comes to bridges and buildings and tunnels and oh, some awesome stuff, we don't do it. We don't tell people how lovely it is and how amazing that we build stuff and how, I mean, Brad, your career is gonna be awesome. You are right at that point in this industry where we're going to change and become so. Oh, I'm, I'm jealous. I really am very jealous that you are right at the beginning of this. Uh, something, it, it's going to be great. And you're right, Ian. I mean, there's, there's never been a more exciting time to be an engineer. I, I mean, you look, I, I think about land surveying. My God, land surveying now is just. It's just on, on it, well, it's on another planet, is it not? I mean, the, the technology that we use, the opportunities that we have, and global opportunities at that, um, you know, they really are out of this world. I mean, Ravi is a really, really good example, you know, mapping Mars, mapping the moon, they are off this planet. Um, and yet, again, young people like Adam, it had just passed you by, and, and it would have passed Brad by as well, more than likely, because there was nobody at school to say, Brad, Maths and physics, my goodness, have you thought about civil engineering? Because I, I imagine, Brad, when you were 12 years old, if Ian Miskimmon had asked you the same question, what is a civil engineer, you'd have probably gone, I don't know. Correct? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. You wanted to ask something, I noticed you popped your hand I, up. I just do you know, it, it, it kind of um, um, it just blows my mind as well. Um, I, I, I am an architectural technologist, but I've recruited so many students in civil engineering um, on the basis that if I wanted to change something about what I did, I, or if I wanted to do another degree or top up, I would do civil engineering. It's such a vast degree. It covers so many different things from environment, from road, transport. It's such an amazingly massive and um, it, it, it can cover so many different elements from nuclear, from energy, from water, from whatever is around us, it can cover. But what, what I was also wanted to, to say, Alison and I have discussed that and Ian, just, you just mentioned it too. I think one, one thing is amazing, what I find is, is amazing we have we have a really we misunderstand life our children probably younger children children completely misunderstand life money comes from credit card and everything else is just there chicken comes from freezers in supermarket you know it's it's just the, the, where things are coming from, how things are happening, how is it that we can jump on a plane and travel and go on holiday? Nobody actually thinks about all those processes, all the civil engineering work that has gone behind that to create that airport, to build it to provide that facilities that you go and have holiday, to make, to build that pool that you go and swim in it. Everything, everything that, the road that you drove from home to airport to get there, or the train that you took to get there, all of these things are the things that we are, the construction industry is responsible for. Without them, nobody can live. Without them, nobody can enjoy any of the things that they enjoy. But it is 
so blatantly available for us that we are blind to see that all of these things are happening are built somebody needs to understand know how to build them how to maintain them why don't we talk about this to our children mm -hmm. why don't we ask why 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 don't we ask more why mm -hmm. good question for brian um, can you remember the, the very moment that you kind of the light bulb came on um, and you, you you knew what you wanted to do as such? Um, can you remember what what was that what was that moment? What made you go, ah, yes, that's what I want to do? Was it a conversation with somebody? Was it uh, watching something on television? Was it what was the what was that that golden moment? I think it was after I finished my work experience. And I was speaking to Jason Hyde afterwards to kind of round up the week, what we'd what we'd done, what I'd all the work that I'd done, and then he would just tell me about more about what he does and the opportunities that he's had and what opportunities would be there. Because at that time I was still considering other options as well. Mm -hmm. Like my brother was in the RAF, so I thought, oh, I could join the RAF as well. So at that moment, I just kind of thought it is achievable and it's really interesting. Hmm. And I, I noticed how, um, I, how my skills compared to other people's skills who were trained in engineering and in BIM and how I could use Revit just as good as they could. And I was 15 and they were 25 and over yeah it's incredible isn't it that those those sort of spatial skills um where your generation and adam's generation being able to see things in three dimensions so when i um did uh, illustration at university uh it was pen on a board so we we we, we use pens and we use boards and when you wanted to rub something off you got a, a razor blade and you scraped out the pen off the board it wasn't that long ago, honest. It was not that long ago. Um, and the way we saw 3D was by drawing projection lines. I'm sure, Alison, I'm, uh, I, I'm sure you must remember these. <laughs> Your projection lines across and getting the, the point of um, vanishing point on the paper and, and making sure you've got this, 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 this drawing. And that's how we interpreted three dimensions. Yeah. Your Minecraft, Adam, is it's three dimensions. It's being able to, um, and this is what I like about uh, the thing here is that in civil engineering and any engineering, planning is so important. It's one of the key disciplines in the whole thing. If you don't plan it properly, you don't get the sequencing right, and you don't get interfaces right, you waste the whole project. It just falls apart. But to plan it correctly, you need to understand how all your bits go together so in your minecraft world you know that you've got to put this block in before that block and then you've got to do this before you can get this to work over here or there are sequences of events that happen and you've got that in three dimensions already in your mind you know it whereas my generation we had to get bits of paper cut them out and put them on the drawing board and then move them around like a stop frame animation to try and make sure that we understood where things went together. Um, Three-dimensional skills are just awesome. They really are cool. And, uh, you know, as I say, that, that planning and that being able to interface things and be able to, to work out how we're going to build stuff is, it is such a key skill. Um, if, if you don't know that, we're not going to uh, be able to build anything in the future. So I, I see the, the the skills that you're learning in that digital world, and in the three D world, in your your Revit world, Brad, and, and your Minecraft world, Adam. Those skills are going to give us a massive advantage in engineering in the future. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool. It, it is, and 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 uh, you know, I, I think the future's fairly safe. Um, with these young digital natives, but I think where the industry is not very safe is that we are failing to recruit them. So I, I've got a question for you, Brad, but I've also got a question for you to think about, Adam, 
in terms of a piece of advice. So Brad, you've been in work now for five years, you're at university now, um, and you know the, the real world of work compared to when you were at school. So if you could go back to school and give a piece of advice to maybe um, head teacher, who I had a lot of respect for your head teacher, he, he made it happen, um, Ben Davis, big hero. Um, but what, what advice would you give to the average head teacher and indeed the teacher of maybe, you know, STEM or something like that? What advice would you give them? Because there's still clearly something missing in education. And while you're just thinking on that, Adam, if there was one thing that you could really, really like to see at school, what change would you like to see? What would it be if you could just think of one thing in terms of you embarking on this potential career in, in engineering? So, Adam, you have a think about that. Brad, what do, what uh, advice would you give them as an, as, as an employee now, never mind a, an ex-student? main bit of advice that I'd give would be just do it earlier, much earlier. Have these conversations earlier instead of leaving it until the last minute in year 11 when you need to start applying for colleges saying okay so what do you want to do give them an idea of what there is to do earlier give them dreams earlier else a lot of the dreams will be being a footballer and that's you know every lad in my class wants to be a footballer and one out of all of them might end up in an academy, but not all of them are going to make it. So there's all these jobs out there, all these careers, not just these construction, there's loads more of just careers that you can get into and you might, you might like. So then you can go home and say, oh, this is actually a good thing playing Minecraft. This is actually helpful. This is real. It's not just a game. Yeah, and so I, I think, I, I, yeah. but but even with your parents, because I I remember your mum, and you alluded to it yourself. Your mum was very very anti you um, taking a, a subject like deck. Um, could schools help parents more? And I, I think it's more of could industry help schools to help parents more? Um, I think there's a threefold issue there, because your mum, if she knew, if she could have looked into the future and seen what you are now compared to when she really, really didn't want you to take subjects like this at 14 years old. But she had no help either, right? No, oh, yeah, that definitely. And I think it's to show that another bit of advice would be to show the full picture to parents, students, other teachers, and see, because I remember even when I got my apprenticeship and I'd, it was confirmed I was still at school and I had a few more exams to go and there were some teachers that didn't really still didn't really know much about sign engineer construct things like that it was just like oh you could have done you could have gone to university you could have gone to college why have you got an apprenticeship and I'd say well I'm still going to go to university I don't I don't plan on not going to university so I think it, it's important to show that it's still a professional profession. It's a profession. It's not a it's not a job. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, even when Brad landed his uh, apprenticeship at Mott McDonald, and and certainly when when I went to see Keith Howells years ago to say, please help us, because I don't think enough people know about great organisations like Mott Mike. Um, and Keith was fantastic. He did help, and and the rest is history, really. But um, I do remember having a conversation with a certain school teacher at your school and talking about Brad Leaves has got an apprenticeship with Mott McDonald and she says, well, at least he's making an effort, you know, it's not, not such a bad career, flipping burgers. And I was like, no! <laughs> um, I want to bang my head against the wall. I am, I'm just, I'm just about, do you know, it's just unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. <laughs> The, the kind of thing you hear but what I hear from what you say Brad is that the schools are reactive education system is reactive is lazy and nobody is proactive enough to do actually plant a seed much earlier make these young people 
feel that they do actually have a purpose they do carry a, a kind of really an important value to their society to their country it is just so if a school is not going to teach you this I think the rest of whatever they are teaching is absolutely junk and I'm, I'm just being you know it's Friday afternoon so I feel free to blast my head <laughs> <laughs> if you cannot teach young young people that they are important that they are the wealth of this nation that they are they are actually the people who are going to make things happen if you cannot teach them that what are you teaching yeah, yeah. so i guess the book stops with you now really so you know you've listened to the you know older folks let's say rumble on for a few, for an hour so what's that one piece of advice what's the one thing you'd change getting people in and offering people potential support for what they want to go into even if they know or don't know i, I think this is the thing you know i, I mean I, i've actually promised adam that after today i'm going to go and help him he's about what 50 miles down the road from me it's not too far i'm going to go down the road we, we, we you know these guys are digital we'll get on zoom we'll have a chat but i'm going to help adam now become that engineer because you know even with with architecture architectures speak to end users before they don't design buildings and we i believe as an industry and indeed as an education uh, as educators should be referring to end users our 12 year old adams a lot more to understand that the, the way they want to learn and therefore the way we need to teach them. So I'm delighted to help Adam. And I know that Adam is probably one of a million 12 year olds who need some help. And I know there's probably about, you know, probably 25 people listening to this who could help too. And I want you all to promise to get in touch with me. I'm gonna give some big ups already because I know there are people already on the line who do so much to help young people. And I'm thrilled you've joined today, but there are lots of Adams out there and we are losing them hand over fist. So yeah. get involved and go and teach young people to suck eggs because it really is that easy. <laughs> so um, how, what, what's my, I'm infused uh, and I've got some time. What do I do now? Tell me what I need to do. Well, we're always needing people because, you know, people like Adam, this is not about, you know, class of your own, design, engineer, construct. This is about helping young people full stop. Mm. The reason I set up class of your own is to do exactly that. I gave up my job 10 years ago. I was a land surveyor. I loved my career. I've always said it's the best job in the world. And I still believe it is now. And Andy Givens is on the line. He'll agree with me. It's Andy from Topcon. I still love surveying. I think, you know, and I say to children, you know, the biggest issue for me is that as Brad didn't, as Adam probably doesn't, children have very little spatial awareness. How the hell are you going to be an engineer or an architect if you don't know how big something is? So think if anything we give to society as land surveyors we at least show what space is you know and 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 and, and to me surveying should be absolutely mm. it should be in the national curriculum but what what do i need to do now what what's my next step to help out it's very very easy you can drop me a line <clears> if you <throat> drop me a line at uh, allison at class of your own dot com um mm -hmm. I want to put lots and lots of Ian Miskimmons in touch with Adams. And there's lots of them out there. We've actually been working. I mean, COVID has been a great thing for us. It's been a terrible thing globally. But in terms of lifting people's head above the parapet and saying, this is how you can help, suddenly we're, we are in a digital space where we don't have to be worrying, oh, I'm going to waste half a day of travel to get into a school. We can now access them. We can access Adams like that. So there's loads and loads of things, ways you can help. We've actually set up a home learning network now for children like Adam who don't have access to people like us and things like we do at school, but they can now do it through home learning. But we still need support of industry. And this is going to be the biggest change in education for me ever, that we are going to start giving children the right to vote what their learning should be and allow them access to stuff like, that we do and people like us. So. So if I drop your line, tell you where I am, um, and you'll help me get in touch with um, school students that will I can mentor and, and, and advise. Absolutely, 100%. Great. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. can I just can I just jump in? Sorry, Ian, go on. I was going to say, it looks like we might have hit that uh, that part of the the hour where um, the, uh, the the webinar is is on its way um, towards the end. Um, so what we're going to do is Stuart's going to um, talk a little bit more about the um, the, the productivity and, and the, the, the the series. But don't forget, we're here on the lock-in, as it were, to carry on talking if we want to uh, for as long as the, uh, the, the, the soft drinks last. <laughs> Fabulous, thanks Ian. Um, okay, so we do have a lot of, um, there are not so much questions. We have got a couple of questions, but um, more comments and statements, which I must read out because some of them are extremely valuable. Um, just bear with me a second though, because I just want to finish off and let everybody know about our program. So, if I can, first off, for those that want to drop off, it's, this is a thank you to Alison and thanks to the team for coming together today. We've got another session on the 4th of September, um, which I'll publicise, but we've got a, a bit of a note on the next slide, which tells me if I can just, if it will click. So it's it's 4D and it's planning for health and safety um, using, using 4D modelling. Please tune in for that on the 4th. Um, the other question, or the other thing is, must say thank you very much to our sponsors, O2 and Rebim. Uh, Nushin, you know Rebim from old, which is which is great. Um, I hope to have Andy on the on the on the um, on another session someday soon. Um, I know he's asking for one, but uh, we're fully booked at the moment. So, um, and the other question I get this every week is there an, is the um, is the, um, the recording available? Yes, it's on the website. It usually goes on on a Monday. It takes a bit of time to download and add on, but it's usually there the um, um, start of each week. So. Um, Anyway, just to carry on, we're going to carry on the conversation. I want to just, if I may, um, just put the questions, statements, comments um, on, if I can just get to them. One second. I can't seem to get hold of it. Right. Um, bear with me. Okay. Right. Uh, Sue Butcher, thank you very much, Sue. I've got quite a lot of uh, statements, comments, questions from you. Um, I'll come to yours in a second, but um, Harry Parnell's on online. Um, Harry, you want to take this offline, um, and you want to know what uh, which Balfour BT projects. I'll get in touch with you. Take that offline. I'll get in touch with you and, and fill that in, fill you in with that. Um, Sue, I think you were particularly enthralled with Adam. Adam, you did a fantastic job today, by the way. I know we're not finished yet, but thanks for being incredibly articulate and bringing out what it's like um, and which direction you know people could could be going in if they just took a bit more notice. I had exactly the same thing when I was at school over 30 years ago and um, I was frustrated and eventually found somebody that had some faith in me. So um, Sue makes a mention about handwriting. Um, Sue, Sue says her son's handwriting is terrible too, but he's just got some fantastic GCSEs. So you don't need to worry about that either. Um, and Sue says, I hope everybody in construction on this call will take the opportunity to support DEC class of your own. Sue volunteered with one of the programmes um, and it's been really great. And it's even taught Sue something as well, which is fabulous. Um, the construction industry, hang on, I've jumped, ahead, I've jumped ahead here. Why has it done that? Jumped ahead. Um, the construction industry needs digital natives to shake it up. You're right. Absolutely, Sue. We need to digitise the industry to make it safe. That's one really important point. Um, Sue's working with houses, associations and manufacturers. Um, so there's some opportunity there. Um, we need to nurture. We need to develop that. Uh, Sue also agrees with Nushin about having a plan. The industry response group set up after the Grenfell should be able to do this. They have done yeah. it without identifying the skills for taking um, cladding off. Um, and they could do with that in the whole of the industry. But my argument is that is why wait for stuff. We always wait for a problem before we develop a solution. Um, we have an opportunity now in schools. Um, Alison's program, I think, uh, will, will help um, definitely provide an answer. Um, OK, so what else have we got here? Sue, you've put loads of links in here. I'll try and share that with everybody. Harry, thanks for the question. Uh, on HS2 Area North, we developed the Curzon Street Viaducts in Minecraft for schools yeah fantastic i'd love to see the outputs of that harry 
if we could do a case study, that would be fantastic. Um, Sue awesome. comes in again. Sue comes in again. Great advice, Brad. Thanks for that. You gave it to us as it is, which is superb. Um, Adam, thanks, Adam, for coming on. This isn't a question. He'd just like to add that everything that he's that's been said is exactly what he experienced. Teachers, I know that's a broad statement you're making there, but teachers need to understand that all kids, not all kids, are academic. Work experience, and I can speak for this as well, is far more valuable than constant time at school. Programs like DC should be supported by the government, Alison. Hey. <laughs> there you go. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> excellent, excellent from Sue. That's that's the third excellent Sue. Thank you. Um, when I volunteered to help, oh, I've said, no, I've done that. I've done that. Have I repeated? Oh, can I just uh, come in, Stuart? Uh, yes. Just while well, on the line, um, government should be helping us. Please tell the government that because the more people tell the government that, the more it might happen. So you know. I'm happy with camp. I think, I think <laughs> we, need, we, we need a posse and we need to go and stand in the lobby and tell them. Indeed. We can organise that. We can organise <laughs> that. So I've done I've done all the announcements. Um I think I don't think I missed anything out unless there's a few more questions. Ah, Harry says at the end he was in the ICE in the full crow tube. So that's the, the Minecraft model. Um do you remember when in the ICE they built the the three D cave, you know, the the Virtual reality immersion cave. Sounds like they put the uh, in there. So Harry, I, I I would love to see that again. Perhaps when we have the uh, the cave again up in London, um, to have that available. And perhaps when all this craziness is over, we'll host another um, DEC uh, class your own event. Get your students in. They can come up and have a play with that, and we can God, let's, let's find somewhere we can do a big Minecraft session. Absolutely, and that's a great idea. There's one thing I want to just add to this as well, and, and I touched on it earlier with Alison. Um, a lot of organizations spend a lot of money, and I'm not sure it's called this anymore, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they used to call it the milk round, where organizations would go around to establishments or uh, universities, sixth forms, whatever, and look for people that they would like in their organization. And there was, a, there was some sort of selection criteria, whatever it was, and if you were lucky, you got a, you got a place. Um, Okay, that was great, but I think there's a better way of doing it. Alison, what, you, what you're doing is you're creating something that not, nobody can buy. It's called loyalty. And if you can establish it earlier, it's worth its weight in, not gold, not, not platinum. It's worth its weight in something that we don't know. Because to have somebody loyal in an organization is incredibly valuable. And if you can get that early, then, well, that's fantastic. It's fabulous stuff. Um, yeah, I think I, 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 I mean, Sorry. Bradley's testament to that. You know, he start, at 15 years old, he discovered Mott MacDonald. He decided that's where he wanted to be. Mott MacDonald were loyal to him. They offered him an interview. He went for an interview. And, and you know, chances are Bradley will be still uh, uh, with Mott MacDonald when he's my age. And he'll probably be, uh, well, I'll be long gone. But certainly I'm hoping that at least he makes chief exec. You know, I mean, this is the thing. The, the thing that I've always said is that the more you can be in front of young people, you've got to be seen to be noticed. You've got to be seen. And I think for, for me, the issue has always been that DEC programs like this are about long term impact. They're not about a short hit. They're about long term impact. They're about nurture. You know, so if we could nurture Adam's talents now and Adam's skills now, and nurture his knowledge now and his thirst for, you know, I want to do something different. I want to learn differently. He can become a Brad, you know, but it's about a long term impact. We can't have the one hit wonders. Um, and, and this is why, you know, I was that one hit wonder. I was working with Balfour Beatty in the Northwest. Um, and Harry, I don't know if I've told you this. I mean, our mate Tony Ellender certainly knows it because it's his fault. That I started Passive Your Own in the first place. I blame him entirely. Um, I was asked to do those assemblies as a female land surveyor. I used to stand on assemblies. I used to have a, a, a robotic total station up on an assembly, and I used to be, you know, letting it use the mon monitoring program on the total station because it had a little red light that dotted around called a laser. And kids used to think this dot was amazing. 
so yeah, and I just got so sick and tired of going on assemblies and going into assemblies and saying, oh, I'm a land surveyor, it's really cool, we use technology, we work in measurement, we do this. And, and the children were really, really interested and they'd all run up afterwards and say, oh, can I have a play? Talk to me some more. And then they'd go home, they'd fall asleep, they'd come back to school the next day and they'd say, that lady who came in, I, I, I want to do that job. What do I do next? And nobody can tell the children because most of the time those events are where all the children are crowded in together. Not many of the teachers do stay and listen because, my God, teachers are so hellishly busy they grab every moment they can. And at the end of the day, this is a careers event, not a teaching and learning event. And I think that's the issue. The, the careers that we do should impact teaching and learning, not just inspiring careers. Sure. And I've always said with, 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 with surveying, it is science, it's technology, it's engineering, it's maths. We have a place in the curriculum. And I think the more we can help teachers to understand that place in the curriculum, the sooner young people like Adam will grasp some concept that he learns in physics and go, oh my goodness, that's civil engineering too. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alison, can I just ask, we've got um, Tom O'Dwyer on, on, the, um, on the attendees. And he's no, waiting to... I'm just <laughs> wondering if Tom, yeah, Mark Motz, I wonder, I wonder if we can invite Tom in. Um, be you know, I've, been, I've been trying to uh, message you back, Tom, but uh, maybe you've not seen my message. Let me see if I can draw you in, Tom, if, if, if that's possible. Um, I'll make you a panellist. You just need to um, unmute and uh, switch your webcam. If that's possible, let's see. What's he doing there, Alison? Email sent. I've just received it, Ian. Thank you very much. The wheeled in billing Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, Hi. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, thanks for joining us, Tom. That's all right. How are you? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong place. That's all, if, all good. If you've got a question for um, any one of the panellists, myself, Ian, fire No, I was, just, I was just going to say, um, like going back to the schools, um, I don't think there is enough emphasis on like um, the practical skills, because I know like even in, um, which in, um, in DT, in um, I, even the making is only worth ten percent. Like for a for a subject where you're actually building and like um, making stuff, I think how is the making only worth ten percent of your overall grade? But yet the exam you see at the end is worth sixty percent of your overall grade. Like that isn't. I don't think that's how. Uh, I think the whole system really needs to change because I don't think it emphasises the more practical skills that are that I use on a day to day basis. Like two, I only started my journey into the industry three years ago, and then the the, the and th this year I've worked on NHS Nightingale, the hospital for that helped with the COVID situation. And like who uh, who would have said three years ago that I would have got my GCSEs and left and um, working on the um, massive um, project that I saw on the news every single day, like working full working forty hour weeks on um, on the project that is affecting the world and the country. It's, it's like I just don't think there's enough emphasis put on like the practical skills that are really beneficial to like what which is how the country runs. And, and, and that's the problem, Tom, because unfortunately, and it's the, it's what I was alluding to earlier with the grammar school approach um, to construction and engineering. Uh, construction isn't an academic subject to most people. Yeah. They don't see it. And, and, and the issue again, practical has always equaled low achiever you know yeah, if, even, even uh, a stigma, you know, stigma behind apprenticeships like even uh, when you say i've got an apprenticeship oh what you don't become a bricky or you don't become a uh, plumber there's kind of looked down on like not that them jobs are bad but it's just like it always has this massive stigma behind it which uh, which is like really not fair yeah and how old are you now tom i, I know you very very well and hello to mom yeah. um and in, <laughs> just your sister's in industry too. How, yeah. how old are you now? I'm 17. So, yeah. And then I'm a traffic engineer. Well, I'm an apprentice tra traffic engineer. I, I wouldn't know what that was. I thought you just pop your traffic lights to just go green. Like, it's funny because my job, my job is no one sees my job. When I've done a good job, is it's not supposed to be talked about because the only time you see a, you talk about a road is when it's bad or when it's not running properly. So I'm working quite a 
like niche thing but it's such an important thing like i as i said i've worked on the nhs nightingale project which i saw on every day like I, every time i went to finish work and turned on the news i thought oh wow look i'm working on that mum look to my grandparents and stuff so it's such an amazing opportunity hi me tom who do you work for uh mark mcdonald another mark mcdonald there you go and, and i'm gonna say this a massive big up to mark mcdonald because you know they really really do hunt our young people and it's just what see them succeed and and very young people by the sounds of things as well <laughs> thanks for coming on tom it's really lovely to yeah, talk to that's you right. yeah at the moment i'm working on the uh nda so a, a, a government yeah. project that is quite private but um i've already i'm already working um on top sign else so i've got a uh, i'm actually ordering people around so that's pretty surreal less than a year <laughs> they're working and i'm uh above someone else it's pretty it's pretty grand amazing thing well done thanks, thanks for joining, oh, thanks no for joining. Problem. is there anybody else in the um remaining attendees would like to come in and and ask a direct question has anybody else got a burning desire to uh say something from our um panelists our team rather jerry go on jerry i just want to say uh, alison i just if i had to sum this up in a word i'd say passion i love your passion for what you do and the passion and enthusiasm of the youngsters and this is from someone who left school in 1968 with having no careers advice, no help at all as to what I might do. And the head teacher wrote in my final report when I left school, Jerry's a lovely personality and a nice looking girl. She'll melt somebody, a lovely wife and mother. And I was not expected to even get work. And I loved the construction research that I went into. So I just think, well, thank goodness for people like you now. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very wow. I take that compliment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So any anything else? We've got um we've done all the questions, I think, now. Um, unless there's anything else I've just seen. No, nothing else. I just wanted to say well done to Tom, to Brad and to Adam. Well done to all three of you. It's so good yeah, to see brilliant. you. It's so good to see your passion as well. Yeah. Tom, I yeah. love the way that you talk about your career. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Absolutely I wouldn't be anywhere about um, at Addison, though. I, I wouldn't even um, thought about going into industry. Like, I, I remember the first time hearing about deck and stuff. I, I know I wouldn't be in, I, I wouldn't be sitting at this desk now. I wouldn't even thought about a career in this industry. I'm so thankful to Addison for giving me that opportunity and for giving me a chance to become where I am today I'm ever so thankful I can thank her enough well you, you you're very you're very welcome and the only thing that I ask you to do uh, in if there's any sort of repayment at all Thomas is go and do the same for Adams of the world that we did for you because yeah. you know you are inspirational and I think it's wonderful and again Harry you've dropped a line with with Fortnite but if you're still on the line there's a tremendous project that we're about to do that I'm talking to Tony about the Balfour Beat you're involved in and you need to know about it because again it's aimed directly at the Adams of the world um, and, and, and Brad um, will, will be involved in it probably doesn't know yet but it will be um, we're doing some phenomenal stuff um, and at the end of the day I suppose what we've always tried to do is give young people as real an experience of our industry as we can it's why we use real people we use real uh, technology and I think the most wonderful thing that comes out of this and I know that Tom will back me up here and Brad will back me up here and Lauren would do the same if she wasn't pouring con concrete is that the teachers that are produced through this program are just absolutely phenomenal because they like the children I mean Brad alluded to it actually when his own teacher Daniel McDonough um, Start, started um, teaching deck. he was product design, he was a design technology teacher, he didn't know about the industry either and he was, last year he was awarded the ICE uh, 200 award um, he's the only non-civil engineer in history who's ever received an award from the ICE um, wow. and, and it is wow indeed because he lives and breathes this subject now you know and he is now teaching teachers 
how to become the teacher that he became. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and similarly with Thomas, the teacher, um, an amazing, if you, if you, if you read the CICES, um, the uh, Civil Engineering Surveyor uh, magazine, Thomas's teacher was in the magazine this month. Um, he's another one who, you know, wasn't a built environment specialist, didn't know really much about the industry. And there are so many young people like Thomas who have succeeded because of him. So actually yeah. what we're doing, we're, the educating the future of construction is actually we're educating teachers. We're educating the educators to make sure that the Bradleys, the Laurens, the Thomases, and hopefully the Adams uh, don't escape us. Um, so yeah, that's what this was always about. Unfortunately, I'm not a surveyor anymore. Don't regret it, I miss it like mad, but there are great surveyors that I know will continue in this. And I will say one thing, um, we, we now, um, and it's a, a wonderful, uh, really, really proud to announce this, we actually are licensed now as the DEC Survey School, so we're creating um, a program just a week long for young people to be able to learn about surveying, uh, the fundamentals of surveying, so they can uh, look at the careers involved. Um, they can explore different opportunities and so again publicly I'm going to say this so thank you to the CICS and the Survey Association for enabling us to do that and the first one is running in Sheffield the next one is in London the next one is in Edinburgh uh, we'll be doing another one in Ireland in the new year and for anybody out there who wants to get involved in any of these sorts of workshops when just come along and show those young people who are still learning what it is we do in industry please again drop me a line it's alison at classofyourown.com even if we can't get you with the school that you want to go and certainly i'm going to so be talking to your dad adam to make sure that we get into your school and make sure that we do capture you before you run away but there's an opportunity for everyone to get involved in one of our schools um and and and, and let's let's solve this problem together sure brilliant well thank you alison um I'm just going to go around the room um, one last time. We, we've we've got a few minutes left, but um, Ian, have you got anything else to add? You're next on the. You're uh, muted. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm unmuted again. Uh, just fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, uh, I am so jealous of Adam because he's got an entire world in front of him. Brad, that you've got an, you've joined an amazing industry and Tom, you're in there and you're now doing it. How cool is that? Um, if only I was 25, 30 years younger, um, <laughs> I'd do it all over again because it's cool and the opportunities are fantastic. And thank you, Alison and Lucian, for, for making all this possible because, uh, yeah, without you guys, our industry would be well yes in trouble i think thank Thanks, you Ian. nushin <laughs> have you got anything to add um i would say let's lobby for uh, our government to become a little bit more proactive in uh, human resource management nationally oh. and supporting our young um younger nation younger younger proportion of our nation to to be the builders of the future of this country. Sure, well, thank you, and thanks for joining us. Brad, have you anything to add? Just thank you for having me on, really. Thank you to Alison as well, for all the opportunities I've had through in industry getting involved in education. Brilliant, well, thanks very much for joining us and uh, and giving us the time to, to come on, and that's the same for everybody. Um, Adam. Have you anything else to say before we uh, close up? Yeah, big thanks to Alison and you for organising this and stuff. So just thanks. Thank you. Alison. Thank you very much. <laughs> go on, Alison, go on. Yeah, I mean, j just just again, Adam, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll drop you a line afterwards. I've got your dad's email address. We've talked on the phone. Um, if you still want to be an engineer and we haven't put you off, I hope we've encouraged you even more. Or an architect, you know, certainly help you. And I just want well, to. Architectural get... technologist. <laughs> oh, I've got quite a few deck students in architectural technology. I'll bet you've not heard of that either, Adam. But I do do just want to say a big up. Um, if Andy's still in the audience, uh, thank you to Topcon for enabling us to use the instruments for for, de for a decade. 
Um, we'll be bringing, uh, I'll be getting into the TopCon to uh, run that survey school again. It's in Sheffield in October half term if anyone wants to come along. And I'm going to say a big thank you for, to Paul at Operam. Our children are using Operam so they understand BIM a lot better than they do now. Um, that's from about 14 years old. So just saying, they're catching you up. And Harry, give me a call. I've got some good news. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Tom, any anything to add to what you've already said? Oh no, just uh, thank you again, Alison, for giving me the opportunity. Very Brilliant. welcome, Thomas. Thanks for joining us and raising your hand. Jerry, before we close up. Now, just to say absolutely brilliant, I've got the most utmost admiration for what you do. Well done. Fantastic. Well, there's um there's a thousand thank yous that I've had. Um even through text and everything else. Um lots of there's quite a lot of follow-ups. I will follow up with everybody. Um, so the last thing to say is thanks, Alison, for, for putting the session together. Thanks for involving the team. And um, thanks, everybody else, for, for joining in and making it a great success. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. And have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Bye.